Okay, hi everybody. Welcome to another episode of From the Bottom Up with David. <laughs> Thanks for having me. He's on every show. It's like, <laughs> it's not a real show without David right now. Because uh, for me, it's being used to just really give myself permission to go deeper into some of these ideas and not assume that I'm really anywhere on the journey. And so today I feel actually to go into the topic of grandeur versus grandiosity. And as usual, as soon as that topic really came to my mind because it was today's lesson, uh, or the reading before the lesson really, I'm given the examples to practice with. I actually was in so much joy with this idea because last night when I was joining with Utah and Susanna in the movie gathering around God Friended Me, the setup was such that we were kind of all doing the gathering and they actually knew more context than I did. And so it allowed me to really stay stepped back and, and almost continue as if it was my show and just mm -hmm. speak from my heart rather than speaking from a crew, like there was no responsibility mm -hmm. to teach. And in that, I just had this really strong flash that not even a flash, but this feeling that that the I know mind, thinking you know how to do anything, is the problem, and that that has been a big problem for me. And at the time, I was looking at another member of the community, and we could relate with it because you know, almost like you develop this intellect, you develop this competency um, to cover over this inadequacy, but you're out of touch with the inadequacy because it was so young, seemingly. And you just become good, and even within the ministry, like joining with you or questions, you just you start to think, okay, I can do that, I can do that, and you think you're being helpful, and, and probably it's all used by the Spirit to a point, but I've always wondered, like Jesus said a few days ago in the Course, He said, um, you may ask how the joy in you can inspire others, and you see all these witnesses, but, but why you don't feel it yourself? And he said, you're making some kind of dissociation. And that was the dis that is the dissociation. Why you don't feel it yourself? Because mm -hmm. if somehow you think you can do anything, then you're not, you're not seeing it's God doing it through you or the Holy Spirit. So I was just sitting there like, wow, everything? No wonder trying to be helpful is like terrible, actually. Murder, as another community member might say. <laughs> And so then this morning when I just heard that grander versus grandiosity section, it was just like hitting me in a very fresh new way. And I just really wanted the whole day to focus on where do I, I see that I think I know. But maybe I'll go straight to the heart for me with the specific context mm -hmm. from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can even get clear on that because, you know, Maslow's Pyramid, you know, the bottom of it is like um, food, hunger, you need to satisfy, you know, whether not being pelted by rain and then a good job and that it all the way up to self-actualization, right? Mm -hmm. Is that the same way that we use from the bottom up? Like you have to, you have a multitude of specifics and then at the end of the pyramid is just this pure joy because in my mind I've always almost inverted the pyramid as if the joy is really the thickest part of the pyramid and the tiny specifics are there, but... Yeah, I don't know. Before I go into my specific, maybe we could... Which way do you see the pyramid and from the bottom up? Well, I think the the bottom would be the the linear timeline. The bottom would be the many specifics. Uh, the top would be abstraction. And so the nature of reality is is abstract. But the bottom is part of the cover or the mask, and mm -hmm. and yet using the symbols from the bottom uh, means not that you're like a bottom feeder, but that you are using what's most relevant um, in the correction. Because mm -hmm. Einstein had said, you know, you can't make the the correction from the from the level can't solve of, the problem at the level can't solve the, the problem at the level of the problem, but actually. You know, the top would be bringing everything back to the mind and then ultimately back to abstract light and love. And starting with the, the specifics is really from the bottom up. So that's why um, 
even though in attitude Jesus was teaching all the time based on that love and that nurturing and that gentleness, it could even be firm, uh, meekness and strength are the same, you know, in, in truth, you know, so because the gentleness and the, and the strength and the firmness are all coming from the same place. But in terms of the parables, you know, he would preface his teachings with, for those that have the ears to hear, let them hear, and oftentimes would give parables, you know, there was a man who had two sons, or talk about two brothers, or whatever the parable was, um, he was getting very personal because people related to the stories and he would try to convey the teaching through the parables so that people could relate to the parables without just having everything just sail over mm -hmm. them because their readiness wasn't mm -hmm. uh, high enough. So it's almost like this pyramid works for our show because in experience this seems to be the mass amount of delusions and it gets tinier tinier to the abstract, but in reality you actually would flip the pyramid because the base is really the strongest. Well, there is no pyramid in the reality, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Because yeah. in designing the show intro, I've always <laughs> wondered what's the best. Your graphics, getting your <laughs> graphics right. <laughs> Metaphysically correct. <laughs> okay. So I'll go to the heart of the matter, which was the specific was now I'm, I'm like a team member on this documentary team. I don't even know if I relate to that term or not, but mm -hmm. I'm just kind of seeing what it feels like. But, you know, I've done all this training with Basecamp to, okay, only use Basecamp if it, um, you know, if it's more efficient than direct communication and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so one of my tasks is to go and like look through film festival to find out which ones we like. And I write all these notes in the Google document and then I've been joining with member of the community on this. And then um, I even voiced all my findings to her. And then today I got a text on Basecamp saying, can you put your results in Basecamp, basically? And it may be the most helpful thing. It may not. But in my mind, it's like after leading whole aspects of the ministry, for me to repeat something, not only repeat it in verbal, but to repeat it in retyping it or copying and pasting another document, there's this instant, like, not a good use of my time. Right? Who are they to ask me? I mean, that's a definite ego thought to me. The first one, I'm not sure. I think of you, like, even you were just mentioning before the show started, just certain things that you're always in prayer about, whether, you know, the symbols direct you towards a certain direction, like, does this serve? Is, are, you know, is it, is it a good flow of support, basically? And um, I think, okay, you know, would David do this, basically? But I can't assume that that applies to me because I'm going through like a, just a humbling around arrogance and the I know mind that we just talked about. So with this kind of a specific, I just feel this like pressure. And then I'm, you know, the best I can get into is like, okay, just pray. And I don't know if I'm supposed to speak to it and follow my inspiration. I don't feel that part's for me, but I'm willing to talk to you again and get it clear because I feel more inspired with that. Or is this a time of just a deep washing of, of arrogance? Because I'd like to go to this section from mm -hmm. the grandeur versus gra grandiosity. The line mm -hmm. that struck me the most in reading that today was, it is easy to distinguish grandeur from grandiosity because love is returned and pride is not. Well, if I think of not doing what it is that's going to be asked and being clear about that, I feel like I'm going to be met with nothing, no love return. Whereas if I do it, I'm going to be angry, not inspired, but I am going to get good witnesses of, good job, Jason. Is that love? Or you know? So it's, it's this confusing thing for me. So I wanted mm. to start with that. Yeah, yeah. Almost like a catch-22. Well, if we go back to that original thing that you mentioned about inspiring and joy in others, uh, but not consistently experiencing the joy in yourself. That's like a stepping stone idea to go deeper into the humbleness, deeper into the grandeur. It's interesting, humbleness and grandeur are coming from the same because they're both wow. love. Yeah. And then 
the more consistently you're humble, the more consistently you're in the grandeur of the Spirit, then you inspire joy in those around you. There's lots of witnesses of thank you, thank you, thank you, and joy, joy, joy. And then it actually transfers to include the whole perception, even the personality self that seems to be the individual self gets swept up almost like a lighthouse that basically s the light sweeps around and eventually mm -hmm. sweeps up the personality self into that love. But it's, it's humbleness that is where that, that reflection of giving and receiving comes back because um, humbleness, which is grandeur, you know, is reflected. Giving and receiving are the same, so you receive it back. You really, it's, it's in heaven, there really is no such thing as giving and receiving because it's still a very dualistic term, as if they're two different things. But in heaven it's just, it's an extension, it's all creation and extension. But in the t time, space, earth plane, then it's like, it's part of a mechanism to teach you that all that I give is given to myself. So, I think part of what happens when you start to go through this humbling process is, it's kind of like when Jesus talks about the stages of the development of trust, he, you know, you get along pretty far and then he says, the teacher of God has not come as far as he thinks he has. You know, he simply was coming closer and closer of, to this discernment of what is valuable and what is valueless. But his, his own mind, his own pride still kept him from understanding the difference between the valuable and the valueless. So in other words, even when you go pretty far in the development of trust, you haven't come as far as you have. Then comes another washing where you have to admit, like I don't, still don't know the difference between the valuable and the valueless, but there is one who can show me. And that's where the humbleness comes in. Show me. Show me the difference. And, and this is where the humbleness gets stronger and stronger. It's like my friend Dorothy um, from years ago when I met her in, in Roscoe, New York. She was uh, basically what, what the world, she never received her, uh, her high school diploma over, or the equivalent over in England. So she was what people would say uneducated. She didn't have a college um, education at all. She comes to Roscoe, Ken Wapnick, PhD, all the teachers have PhDs, EDDs, the Doctorate of Education, a PhD. She's the whole, all the teaching staff, even Gloria, uh, I think she had her, her uh, degree in, in education. They're highly educated people. And then she's got all this humbleness and joy, and she's really living a very humble life, Dorothy is, and then the PhDs the, uh, in the, the staff is drawn to, to her lightness, her laughter, her big smile, her joy, and they start to help out with her in the kitchen. And then she starts joking with them. Uh, when they're cutting celery or cutting potatoes or whatever, she'll say with a big smile on her face, is this a high job or a low job? So the high job, low job thing was was part of the hierarchies of the world. Mm. The high jobs are the ones that are the people that are the most educated, the most skilled, that know how to do things, that have the greatest skill sets and so on and so forth. The low jobs are often, you know, oh that's menial work they call it. The garbage collectors, the janitors, the, the cooks, although cooking, you know, if you're a sous chef and, you know, that could, okay. depends on that. But but basically, the point of humbleness, and which is where true grandeur is, is that, that you see everything the same. So for me, I think there was a time in my life where I kept using early on this, is this the best use of my time, is this the best use of my time? It seemed a very important question. It was part of a bigger thing about what is your will for me? What is the guidance? Because at times when I would be sent off to like South America or some of the places, from the previous learning it wouldn't have been judged as, as, as good of use of the time as, as when I was 
traveling, speaking, writing, doing all these other things, and yet it was a big let go to go down to South America. It's like jumping into the Amazon River mm. and, and coming into that humbleness of that laughter, that joy, that peace of mind, that state of mind which is true teaching. Teaching is not with words. In fact, if the, if the attitude isn't congruent with the words, then, then you might say it's, even if it's eloquent, it could be poorly taught. Someone could be eloquent and, and arrogant <laughs> at the same time, and that is, is not grandeur. Uh, someone could be articulate mm. and um, pompous, and that is not, is not grandeur. Uh, so you start to see that some of the things that seem to be valued so much now have to. The lesson is is humbleness, and the lesson is is letting go of all judgments uh, about it. And one example of that would be when I. Uh, formed this uh, Yahoo group years ago called Awakening in Christ and I would receive um, people signed up and then I would take on emails and I would pray and a lot of times my assistant Kathy would open the door and come in and she would see me there with these two fingers this was back, these weren't thumbs, these were back in the day I had a full keyboard but I wasn't a typist so it was trickling out of me, almost like Morse code or something. Do, 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 you know, <laughs> literally letter by letter, these two little pointer fingers, <laughs> and you know, to the world of, you know, the ego and of linearity, you know, that is not the most efficient way to type. Although for me, I was, it was like I was praying and I would just take in the email, and I would really connect with. Jesus and mm -hmm. with the Spirit, the so Holy Spirit. That's almost helpful. Yeah, it was almost helpful. It would, do, 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 you know, it was coming oh, out, great. just like <laughs> speaking very slowly. You know, you can, people tell me sometimes when they, when I travel around the world and I'm in countries where there's translations, um, I I have to speak. It comes out in short, short sentences, <coughs> for the benefit of the translator, because not everyone can spool it up and take like a 30 seconds or 45 seconds of talk and then spool it out in, in the language. So most of the translators I have, they like it, keep it short and sweet, short and sweet, short and sweet. And then I've had people come from the audience to tell me who are bilingual, oh I, great, I get to hear it from in your English and then I get to hear the translation and they said I, it goes in deeper when I hear it in two uh -huh. languages at the same time repeated. So you know, from what on the surface could be judged in any number of way of chopping things up, you know, there are people that are still feeling the blessing of things. So really the key is to let go of all judgment. When I was there, sometimes Kathy would open the door, she would come in, but she would see me going like this, and she knows I was answering emails, which eventually those emails became, I think the book Healing in Mind, you know, a whole book came out of those. but. She would be very, just, oh, let him go, he's in, he's in prayer and yeah. he's in purpose. Fun functionally, I'm sure it would look to a lot of people like, oh, that's pathetic, <laughs> it's actually <laughs> pathetic. But it was actually, for me, a, a mechanism of getting deep into prayer and really tuning in uh -huh. and, and giving myself over. So not a lot of attention was going to the fingers, because, you know, it would be very slow, but the full attention was really into the connection with spirit, mm. and so that's just an example of, mm. of a way that the grandeur goes in, and I'm sure that of course has been reflected back to me in the multitudes uh, mm -hmm. because of the devotion. I, I poured my heart in, I gave, mm -hmm. gave, gave from my heart, and I've received so much because giving and receiving are mm. the same, but it, there wasn't this thing on my mind, you know, this is ridiculous, this is slow, I should just um, record this and have somebody else type it out. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't have any of those coulda, woulda, shoulda thoughts. I just totally had given myself mm -hmm. over to, to the prayer. Wow, it's very humbling then to just, where there I was leading, now I'm being led. It's like, but the thing that, so what, and this may be the voice, I'm just going to expose it, but, so when you're saying all that, like when I grew up, you know, I've, 
was cleaning with toothbrushes, like toilets and around, and it, it wasn't a thing to not clean. It was clean to whatever, you know, piping, fix things. I, there was never this hierarchy of this one's be- At least it wasn't conscious. Mm-hmm. I didn't even really want to go in engineering. I'd rather have, like, become a mechanic or mm-hmm. something in a way, like something more blue-collar. Yeah, say. yeah. So when I would hear, like, I mean, I really hear what you just said. I felt it. But does this mean that I really believe in a hierarchy of jobs that I never thought? I guess I, it must mean that. Maybe it's just more nuanced around talking versus writing or something. I don't know. Yeah. Hey, I think it can be the difference. It, it's like somebody who's, who's used to being an, an actor and used to having lines and rehearsing lines and so forth, and then suddenly they're put into a situation where the director goes, no, this is 100% improv. Um, you're just going to be out there like that. Henry Jaglum, you know, would kind of <laughs> tell these professional actors and actresses who are coming to shoot a professional movie, here's the scenario, here's, and the, he would give the background yeah, on the yeah, whole yeah. thing and this and this and this, and he would say, now, you're, you and you, get over there, and then he would say, roll cameras. You know, <laughs> and then the cameras are rolling and away they go. For many times, the actors basically had reactions like, this is very unconventional and I'm used to having lines, <laughs> like, you know, actual lines that I memorize. Yeah. And, and yet I bring that analogy in is because it's similar to that where sometimes how we've said all hands on deck when we're getting close to doing a big retreat or something where it's mm-hmm. like we just pull everyone in, everyone help as best you can, and all hands on deck. And it's kind of the spirit of all hands on deck, plus the spirit of, of spontaneity and that serve mode. You know, I want to serve because I want to be undone from pride. I want to get into true giving, mm. true joy, true extending. Mm. and. And I would like to get more and more clueless of, of what anything means. In mm-hmm. other words, I would like to get to a point where I don't use my past learning at all. I zero past learning. It's just very much in the moment. Mm. And I would say if, if you get more into the spontaneity, you get into making no attempt to figure any, the situation out, to decide what the situation means ahead of time, and to being done through, we'll say, then you get, you're more likely to go into cluelessness and humbleness and devotion with that characteristic, with, without mm. falling back on those past patterns. And then in that, you know, of course, salvation is I do not know what the thing I am. Four things again? Boy, to repeat. <laughs> <laughs> Just give me one of them. Give me well, one. It was being done through yeah, was the okay. last one, but the spontaneity, <laughs> no past reference, you know, wow. it, you can start to see all of those things work <laughs> towards the same thing, it, which is letting go. Let go and let yeah. God. And that's the key. That's wow. the key because salvation is defined quite late in the text as I do not know the thing I am, what I'm doing, where I'm going, how to look upon the world or myself. Mm. Salvation is born when the mind is empty of preconceptions, mm. which are judgments. You know, that's why Jesus had said, judge not. He wants to have us empty our mind of, of judgments, concepts, preconceptions, so we can behold mm. truth, reality, exactly as it is. And that's how this all fits into what you're going through. Mm. Oh, I feel better. Thank you. I'm, now I'm like excited to apply it. Like, <laughs> okay, show show me more. Yeah. Wherever there's like a. <coughs> yeah. So that feeling then is really just. It seems so thick. Like it just comes up and it's like. <coughs> you know, in contrast to like, the first line of grandeur versus grandiosity, where. Which I could feel when he was reading it. It was, grandeur is of God and only of Him. Therefore, it is in you. Whenever you become aware of it, however dimly, you abandon the ego automatically because in the presence of grandeur of God, the meaninglessness of, this, of the ego becomes perfectly apparent. Yeah. I mean, the contrast between that and the... Yeah, the, the contraction. Yeah, 
contraction of the ego. Hmm. Okay. Wow, there's a couple things I want to go into here. When this occurs, even though it, it does not understand it, the ego believes that its enemy has struck and attempts to offer gifts to induce you to return to its protection. Those gifts would be anything that you value of the world, most likely, not the, not the painful aspect, mm -hmm. the things that you value. Self-inflation is the only offering it can make. Really struck me. That's that strong mm -hmm. I know. Like that's an I know mine. Mm -hmm. The grandiosity of the ego is the alternative, is its alternative to the grandeur of God. Which will you choose? So that's, I mean, that's just striking to me somehow. Like self-inflation is the only offering it can make. Like the very thing that I thought was being used to be helpful. Like, oh, even from the very beginning, well, I'll come help pull the trees out of the gutter or... I mean, I've heard this a hundred thousand times since I've been here, but for some reason it's like really... Yeah, it's just touching me on a deeper level, like almost how do you function and then as the next thought, like... Yeah, you know. I think that the skills are so lifted up and those skills are tied into a body identity as well, so they can be channelized in in a truly helpful way. That's why the prayer is I am here only to be truly helpful, because the helpful is so tied into the physical and helpfulness. All definitions, you know, that come through the ego filter are going to be seen in very physical ways. Or even mental skills and abilities, you know, that still relate to the body in some way. Those can all be hijacked and of course misused yeah. to keep the mind into pride and, and grandiosity. However, the more that you are willing to let go, it's more like you're, you're being drawn toward that cluelessness, like toward that, like the reluctant saint, towards that innocence, towards that, um, that state of mind that's prior to time, prior to the world, a priori. It's the I amness, which mm -hmm. is where the grandeur is. And so, as you come along, it's the ego will always say, oh, you've done this before, you're skilled, you're experienced, you know, it tries to use all the past reference. So I think what's happening is you, you know there's a bigger lesson here than participating on a team, than a bigger lesson than leading a team. There's an opportunity to slip into this innocence that is prior to time. And what a glorious uh, opportunity that is. It's a huge opportunity. And it's only these past thoughts that get in the way. That even in terms of analyzing time and say, oh, that's not the best use of my time. Like I was using the example of the, the fingers typing because to many they would say, well, get a typist for God's <laughs> sake, David, come on. But no, it was it was part of a prayer for me. You know, it wasn't I wasn't concerned uh -huh. with the speed of the yeah, yeah. the letters coming out at all. I had no concern about that. That wasn't the lesson. And I think that's that's what's happening in in the sense that um you know, you you have been very willing to let your skills and abilities be used and they have been used, you know, for years in very very helpful ways. And now it's just hon honing in on the most important lesson for you, yeah. you know, which is that innocence that's prior to time. If it's prior to time, it must be prior to all doings. Uh -huh. If it's prior to time, it must be prior mm -hmm. to all seeming form collaborations. There must be a, a diamond in the rough that's, uh -huh. that's there, the shining diamond, and, and really that's what you're praying for. And then you just then trust that everything's being orchestrated by the Spirit to help you experience what you truly want to experience. And that's so different from the ego that is always looking at things on the timeline, always trying to judge what's being done, where it fits in, where's the personal recognition, where are the, where's the praise, the accolades, mm -hmm. you know, those kind of things. The ego is always trying to, it's, it's, its own self aggrandizement, its own self-expansion. It's almost like a, 
Like it's always trying to puff itself up in mm -hmm. a personal way to draw attention to itself in an image way, which is really look at, look at my image. Isn't my image great? Isn't my image wonderful? You know, that's not wow. the, the grandeur, that's the, that's the puffy pride mm -hmm. that no matter how much it puffs, it never satisfies. You see people that are at the top of their professions, they, they have huge salaries, live in huge mansions, they have everything at their fingertips that the world would say you've succeeded on every front, mm -hmm. and yet they're unfulfilled because they, they haven't really gone in the direction of that I am mm -hmm. that's prior to that. Uh, just yesterday I, I had the privilege of, Svava and I again um, watched um, Be Dazzled. And, um, I can hear you. Yeah, so hard. It was, it's just always so hilarious. But um, Elizabeth Hurley playing the devil and Brendan Fraser with all these characters, uh, including his first one right out of the bat was the girl of his dreams, married to the girl of his dreams, and very rich. And he tells the devil that's his wish. <laughs> and so sure enough, He's very, very wealthy, and he, he's the girl of his dreams, he's married to, it's everything that he asked for, except she everything else. Him or something? No, 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 well, I, that and more, you know, it's, <laughs> he's, he's a Colombian drug lord, so right. <laughs> he thinks he's like powder or flour or something, he's like co cocaine, he's, so he's involved with cocaine, with the Russians who want his cocaine and all these different things that come in, and he speaks Spanish, which he could never speak Spanish. <laughs> and then he tries to rip his mustache off, and he tears his skin. So he's got this corny little band-aid. Yeah, that's why I was laughing because, you know, the whole premise of the movie uh, was that that you can wish for things and you can be satisfied and fulfilled with things other than God. And and uh, he goes for it in the world, you know, he thinks, you know, like, well, what have I got to lose? You know, she's like saying, well, your soul, and he's, you know, she tries to play it down, like, uh, what is a piddly little soul, you know, and, but he starts to go deeper and deeper into it. But it's a perfect comedy uh -huh. for showing how easy, easily it is to get distracted in anything of the world, any outcome of the world, any wish mm -hmm. for anything in particular of this world. Yeah, I didn't know how many I had when I came in. I thought I'd finished them all, but it's like it's been revealing these past 10 or 15 years. And the ones that I needed to play out would be given, but only to, for the undoing, you mm -hmm. know. Wow. Yeah, well, this other line. I'm say hi to everyone. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> so one of the lines that um, I talked to somebody yesterday, because they said it's yet to be determined if because I just joined this team, it's yet to be determined if I'll be of value or not. <laughs> and I heard that. <laughs> and I was like, I just felt instant offense. Like. <laughs> well, it should be, truth be told, is you've, you've been on this team because you were doing camera work and, you know, a lot. So, you know, if they have the big credits that roll down for <laughs> All the, the director, producer, editing, some editing and camera yeah. <laughs> work and everything like this. So you should just take it as, um, you know, it's yet to be determined if if your f services will need will be further required. <laughs> okay. You know, now don't take it as a as a personal insult. You've already been used. You may or may not be used more. But that's part of the humbleness of mm. just being in the, I am here to be truly helpful, I am of service. You know, I'm here to be of service if, if I'm asked, you know, so. There's no past in that, it's just. No, yeah. And then if, 
even when I think of it in the future, I'm like, or I'll be kicked off. Like it's like it's only the if the only pure way to look at it is, you know, true value comes from that presence underneath that finger typing. Mm -hmm. And is that going to be my experience or not? Like, yeah. Yeah. Hey, you know, you were you appeared in the film, right? So yeah, you could be. You get called over to cons and <laughs> and walk down the My streets in France and I go there. He is. That's the, he's in that movie. That new. <laughs> it could come at you the other direction. <laughs> <laughs> we had that happen here because uh, we're so close to the Park City to the Sundance Film Festival, and I do remember the year that. Uh, Mr. Nobody was showing. Oh Our yeah. Friend Cody yeah, yeah. went down. He had had a crush on one of the actresses that had played uh -huh. one of, um, of his his loves in the movie, his three yeah. loves and everything. And he ended up just being stunned at seeing her walking down the street. Uh, but those things happen at yeah, film yeah. festivals. Always mind watching. Yeah, okay, yeah. do I have any pride in this? Am I yeah, still yeah. associated with? Anything. And do I have any pride? You mean in just seeing somebody or getting recognition? Or? Yeah, those subtle things. Wow. I mean, it, I think for those that are actually in front of the camera, it's it's kind of a big. You know, these um, film festivals can can be massive, and people are wanting to see the actors, and they're so happy when the actors actually come mm -hmm. to the film festival, and they can. They got the autograph hounds out and all this other stuff going on. So, it's a it's a little easier being uh, behind the the camera. But I think you know you were in this movie. You were behind the camera and in front of the camera. So, <laughs> if you wear that hat that you had out at the monastery over there, <laughs> well, that wouldn't be very appropriate. A winter hat in in May in Cannes. But. Right, <laughs> right, right. That red and white. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it was striking to me because when the, pers the person even said, do you consider yourself valuable when I took offense? And I was like, anything I put my heart into, I consider valuable. But it was missing the point. There was like a feeling of v value associated with the giving. And so then to have that realization last night and even this whole talk, I think it's <coughs> taking a chunk at that or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. I self-concept. Yeah. Okay, I got a couple more lines I'd like to read. Okay, great. So, grandiosity is always a cover for despair. It is without hope because it is not real. It is an attempt to counteract your littleness based on the belief that the littleness is real. Without this belief, grandiosity is meaningless and you could not possibly want it. And the next line's great too, but I'm going to stay with that one because, so when I hear that line, what I think of is I always thought I had an unworthiness problem, but I remember talking with you one time and others were around and, and I said, yeah, they, because you had meant, I don't want to use names, so you had mentioned they have um, an unworthiness problem. And I said, I feel like I have the same thing too. And you, my interpretation was, no, they have an unworthiness problem. And I took it like, I don't. Well, what have I got going on? And so I read this now, and I'm thinking you're, you were saying, you know, it's um, a grandiosity problem. And until today, I didn't, something about it never really struck me. And so maybe the way, and they're really the same, but the way that the ego is playing it out with me was this, whether it's unconscious or conscious, I can do it, I got it, skills leading the way. So would that be, <laughs> I don't know, would that be a correct way of saying that that's why you wouldn't say it's an unworthiness problem because it's not. That wouldn't be helpful because then it would be like, okay, well then I'll, I'll speak up. I'll say, and that wasn't the issue, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. I don't really know my question, but it was, it just kind of flashed through my mind. Yeah, well, it's. I think it's just getting precisely clear. Like, the course is so helpful that nothing you think or say or do or make can establish your worth. Your worth is only established by God. So. You start to see that this worthiness issue is is an identity issue. Am I as God created me, or am I? Did I make myself? Is really where the 
sense of worthiness uh, is, is uh, triggered. Am I a perfect child of God, created perfect spirit, innocent forever in the holy mind of God, or did I try to make myself in any way, shape, or form? That's where the worthiness issue. For example, another way we could come at it would be this thing of self-esteem. A lot of times I'll hear parents tell me, you know, oh, I feel so bad. My children have very low self-esteem. And so you really have to look at which self is it yeah, yeah. that has low self-esteem because they try to counteract the low self-esteem with maybe they don't have a, a good uh, uh, sense of a body image or s mathematics or, or spelling and alphabet or all the things that this world grades, um, beauty, physical beauty, um, athleticism, all these things, if people don't seem to have them, then they, people say they're low self-esteem. And so the ones that do have all these things, they say they're high self-esteem. And they're both grand grandiosity. They're mm -hmm. both grandiosity. Mm -hmm. Low self-esteem in that way and high self-esteem. So that's why you have maybe children that try to with their parents help overcome all these deficits, deficits, build their self-esteem, build it, build it up. And then sometimes they get into high self-esteem as the world judges it. And they're now competent, attractive, smart, and all these things. And then they go out, they get lots of education to build their esteem even more, build their skill level, get win the beauty contest, get to graduate top of the class, and then get caught up in meaningless ego games of bigger, better, faster, more, trying to develop careers and all these things that the world judges as helpful and popular, still building false yeah, yeah. self-esteem, which is grandiosity. And then, then they get into drugs because they're unfulfilled, they're suicidal, sickness comes. Yeah. they get sick, they, they go through accidents like that uh, Molly's game, you know, there's an example, yeah. extreme, she, yeah, 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 all yeah. these skills and abilities yeah, and yeah. great skier yeah. and then the, the crash, a little piece of, uh, you know, tree, tree branch yeah. uh, sticking out there and then the whole thing seemingly, you know, ends her skiing career and the Olympics and all her pursuits. So you have to start to realize that it's all part of grandiosity. The the low self-esteem, the things that are lacking, and the, the overachievers, we'll call them, uh, the great achievers, you know, that's all p part of a cover of what you just read is despair. That all is the ego's invented learning to build a self apart from God, apart from spirit, apart from love and oneness, that's really got a dark layer, a, a lump of guilt, of fear, of shame, of pain, of, we'll call it, unworthiness underneath that uh, this denial of being a perfect child of God. And then all this other added on stuff is a way to try to cover over the despair without letting it go. And that's why they get into drugs and cocaine or end up in, into prostitution or running card games mm -hmm. illegally or all the different things that that movie shows and that many, many things show, which are all part of grandiosity as well. So would, would the, like you use the child example, the child that has low self-esteem, would, if they didn't commit suicide, so to speak, would that be even better than the, the ones that try to develop the self-esteem? Like, are you closer? when you kind of just, I don't know, don't try to change the fact you have low self-esteem? Is that better? Well, it's like, in the end, if spirit is everything and the world is nothing, then that's like trying to have a discussion to say, is low self-esteem better or is high self-esteem? Most people in the world, all the clinicians and everything would say, oh, you, you've got to have the high, high self-esteem at some point. Although, there are those that ha have had very, we'll say, low self-esteem, low skills and abilities, but somehow they pray or they have a, a, an awareness that, and a readiness that, that this world contains nothing that I want. 
Uh, like we'll call them like indigo, crystal, mm -hmm. those kind of children that, that may not have uh, a high uh, self-esteem at all, but they also are closer to that lesson 128 from the course, the workbook, the world I see holds nothing that I want. And so it's not really a matter of high self-esteem or low self-esteem, because as I've said, they're both yeah, grandiosity, yeah. and grandiosity is not really a matter of degree. Mm -hmm. You either believe in it or you don't. If you don't believe in grandiosity, then you can wake up to the grandeur of spirit. But if you do believe in it, then you, you can see it's not really a matter of degree or d direction, and it, you can't even say one is ultimately better than the other because they're both illusions. Yeah. They both are part of the belief in a hierarchy of illusions. I understand that, like metaphysically, I can still see though, I'm putting them mm -hmm. in a hierarchy because, okay, you've developed this, I've developed this, whatever, what I perceive as skills and all this, and now I got to undo it. It's like, oh my God, how do you undo all those skills? So, so it almost seems like I could go back to low self-esteem, where it originally started, and then hopefully pop through. So that's why it's better to me, but, but actually, yeah, it's not really necessary. I would say it's more that are they under Christ's control? Like, it's, That's what it's, it's the humbleness okay. of giving it all over, and again, coming back to that cluelessness. I mean, we we have that movie being there in our collection, and uh, and he's quite clueless, and there's all kinds of things seemingly projected onto him. But and the, I remember showing that at a. At many years ago at a, a, psych, a psychology institute uh, with people, students who followed me all the way to that last scene when he walks out on the water and sticks his umbrella down and they're like, oh, I don't, I, that <laughs> one lost me, like that was too far. Like he was so clueless that he, he didn't know that you're not supposed to be able to walk out onto water and when he did, some of the students were like, whoa, that was, that was like, and then you hear him say, life, the, vo the final words in the movie are, life is a state of mind. Yeah, and yeah. then we zipped into that. But, but yeah, it's not necessarily that, it's not so much unlearning the skills as it is letting them be channelized yeah. by the Spirit in this, toward the atonement. You know, that's a good use of mm -hmm. all skills, no matter what they are. And it's not a more or less or a, like a learning or unlearning that way. It's more of a, a repurposing. So then the, I'm probably going to get crucified for this. But <laughs> <laughs> so the ones that don't have the skills, can they, their skills can't be rechannelized, but it could be that Jesus just starts using them in ways and they not learn, but they're done through. As a, you wouldn't call it rechanneling them anymore, though. They're channeling the skill itself, too, like more like, uh, okay, I need a helicopter, how to drive a helicopter. Right, like Trinity, Trinity in the Matrix, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that the key there comes back to the prayer of the heart, which is this desire to wake up, the desire to know God, that's the most important thing. And it's just when the ego skills have been learned, or anything has been learned, that needs to be unlearned, really it means it, it needs to be taken, learning has to be given over to the Holy Spirit toward forgiveness or toward the atonement. Mm -hmm. That's the central thing. It, it, it's really not so much a discussion about, you know, letting go of things as it is repurposing, like mm -hmm. allowing the Holy Spirit to repurpose everything in the mind. Mm. Yeah. That's the key. And then so then the low self-esteem ones would, yeah. Is it the same question? It's still a repurposing? I yeah, I think it's, it's more like, you know how people say uh, it's, a, it's good to be able to laugh at oneself. Actually, even things that are, seem to be part of low self-esteem and everything can be quite humorous from, the, from forgiveness. So you don't, like me poking fun at the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the fingers, it's not, it's not a matter of uh, trying to gauge them as low or high, it's just starting to see the folly of skills oh my God. in their entirety. Wow. And that releases the mind into the peace and the happiness, because everything of this world is folly. 
it's always nice to be reminded that there's nothing that was made by the ego, nothing in perception that is ultimately, uh, has any eternal value. So I was like trying to figure out what to do for the people that, and you just like turned it back in a way for me to see it, and I was like, yeah, I like it. Wow. The folly is, of it all. That one's going to ripple for a while. I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Can I keep going here? Yeah, yeah. So, the essence of grandiosity is competitiveness because it always involves attack. It is a delusional attempt to outdo, but not to undo. Yeah, I don't know. It just seems so deep. It's all yeah, yeah. Well, it's so beautiful how how people will talk about the the joys of um, competition, whether it's in business <laughs> or in sports or whatever. But it's the, the camaraderie. They'll sometimes the fellowship, the lessons of sharing the same goal to win. You know, <laughs> it's it, to me. It's the deeper you go, you start to see past this. You see basically. That whatever the ego made, let's say the ego made time and space, the ego made all the concepts, all the images, and the Holy Spirit can use what the ego made to point beyond the ego. So anything that is being used to transcend the ego is helpful. Uh, the Holy Spirit can use time to teach that there is no time. Uh, the Holy Spirit can use anything to take the mind higher and higher and higher. And ultimately, that is what the Holy Spirit does. You might say it's like a sorting out of the true from the false, and it's also a preserving what's real and true and eternal, and using the symbols just to point and direct the mind into the experience of the eternal. Mm. And, and really that's very simple. That, that means you don't have to get caught into trying to uh, walk the fine line between illusions. Uh, atonement is the, is the helpful illusion. Forgiveness, the miracle, is a helpful illusion because it leads out of the, the seeming many, many other illusions. Mm. It's the one illusion that leads away from them back towards eternity. So that's why it's so important, I think, to focus on that. That's why we're doing From the Bottom Up. Mm. That's why we do books and travels and tours. That's why we do mm. movies. That's why we do counseling calls. Mm. That's why we build websites. Mm. You know, it just has one purpose, is, is that peace of mind in releasing the mind from illusions and accepting the, the healing in the mind. Mm. So it's very focused, mm. very precious. Thank God we have that alternative to, instead of trying to undo everything, there's like a, a positive yeah. launcher out. Yeah, yeah. It takes you, takes you to healing. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Beautiful. Thank yeah. you. From the bottom up. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> we love you. Love you.